Hey guys, what's going on? Megan here. Continuing the series. Today we have Tom Platts on today's episode of the arena. Now, before I get started, make sure you watch the other videos of the arena so you have an idea of what the topic is about and, you know, stop me from going into the details. So pretty much, we pick bodybuilders or, you know, strongman, powerlifters, whatever, you know, people who have exceptional physiques that we can derive lessons from, right? People who built phenomenal body parts using, you know, out of the norm techniques or thinking outside the box, you know, situations such as that. So, of course, I'm doing IBB pros for now, but I'm also going to go into natural bodybuilders and on and so forth. And before I continue, remember, guys, we know steroids are involved. We know genetics are involved. But the goal we're trying to do here is we're looking for these uh, specific groups of people who, on, in spite of the steroids and in spite of the genetics, still found ways to push growth to the next level, still found ways to get a competitive advantage above their um, their colleagues. So on today's show, we have Tom Platts, one of my um, one of the most inspiring bodybuilders ever. If you study his history and his philosophy on training, it'll blow your mind. He was known as obviously, as you can tell from the picture, as having the best legs in history you know i think in my personal opinion that he still has the best legs in history but again you know people ronnie coleman came along you know kai green branch warren kind of changed the game a bit but still hands down in the hall of fame when it comes to when it comes to legs tom Plass is number one so how did he build those legs we're going to discuss that in the next i just want you guys to see other shots of his freakishly insane legs i mean I've done I've done videos of Tom Plass in the past, but uh, it feels like the first time I've ever seen Tom because his legs are just amazing, amazing quad and hamstring development. I mean, he was way ahead of the game, you know, in the '80s, blew the competition out of the water again when it came to legs. Now, I have to put this picture here because I know for the people who don't know Tom Plass, they'll probably think, "Oh, he just had great leg genetics," and I will show them this picture. Mind you, Tom Plass started lifting weights when he was nine years old. In this picture here on the left, he's in obviously in, in the later part of his years. I believe he was in college when he took that picture. But this is somebody who's been lifting at that stage on the on the picture on the left for over ten years. You know, close to ten years. And um, look 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 at the way his legs look. That is not genetics, folks. That is not genetics. When you are genetically gifted, even before you start lifting, you start to see signs of your genetic disposition. You, I mean, you're not gonna see insane muscularity unless you're west african or some shit but you're gonna see signs that you're genetically gifted in a body part when this is not the case here how much more for up to 10 years after you've been lifting you know so everyone that knows tom Plass knows he did not have great quad genetics or great leg genetics you know he now as far as his structure his body structure allowed him to squat uh huge amounts of weight but in terms of hypertrophy and and you know building muscle he did not have leg genetics as you can tell from this picture here here's another comparison and people will say well you know it, it, you know it has to be genetics you know because i mean there's no way you could build legs that big you know and this and that this and that and i'm gonna get to the drug later but i have to remind people that the people who say this normally don't know what what good genetics mean you know let me look let me show you one of the elite cases of good genetics right we have phil heath right this is when he was playing basketball this is before he started bodybuilding you know compared to you know, Tom Plaza has been lifting for years. This is Phil here before he started bodybuilding, playing basketball. And you could tell already that he was genetically gifted. Look at his shoulders. Look at his triceps. He looked better in this shot than most people look after years of lifting. Another picture here, you know, of Phil Heath. You know, that is called genetics. Look at his calves. Look at his triceps. Look at his shoulders, right? This is before macros, before steroids, before pumping iron, right? That's what you call genetics. Look at that definition. Look at the separation, right? And compare this to Tom Platz's legs, all right? So before before this, this video moves on, let's get let's move genetics out of the you know out of the equation. Another thing people will say is steroids, steroids, which which absolutely play a role. You know, all of these series I let the viewers know, even though I don't have to because it's common sense. Now, obviously, yeah, these guys are on steroids, so you can't really. Um, analyze them without putting that into consideration but then i tell him this arnold was on steroids and arnold did not have nowhere near 
the quad mass that Tom Plass has. I mean, not even close, you know. Uh, I showed him this picture, you know, of the famous picture of Lou Ferrigno and um, Tom Platts. Lou was on steroids, you know, top bodybuilder, you know, in, in his era, second to Arnold, right? Look at his legs. You mean to tell me his, the steroids that Tom Platts were using were not working on Lou Ferrigno, right? Look at this picture here, right? This is Arnold in one of his uh, best shapes ever, and look at his legs, and look at Tom Platts' legs, you know, and then these guys were in the same era, you know, approximately. So, again, yes, steroids play a part. Yes, genetics play a part. But we can clearly see that when it comes to Tom Platts, you know, even when we look at this shot here, right, we can see that even after he started juicing and years into training, he still didn't have the freakishly huge quads that he has, that he was known for. So, what does that boil down to? That tells us, as researchers and analysts and common sense motherfuckers, that he discovered something. He found something that worked in order to have such tremendous size in his legs, even though he was he was on the same stuff everybody else was on. And the secret is simple. That's what this video is going to focus on. The top five things that Tom Blast did, I would say, differently than his peers. You know? And he was ahead of his time because a lot of his methods are still being used today. And a lot of his methods are being discovered by science in research, you know, in recent studies where they're, they're figuring out, oh, my God, this guy was ahead of his Years he instinctively knew things that we were just beginning to prove, you know, five, six, seven years ago. You know, some studies even came out two, three years ago, backing up the stuff that he discovered back in the 70s and 80s. So, number one, obviously, is squats, right? Um, the most important exercise in his journey to build massive quads, massive hamstring, massive legs was obviously squatting, right? But not any kind of squatting. It was most, you know, mostly Olympic style squats, meaning bars high on his back, uh, uh, legs are kind of close as opposed to wide, kind of like a, you know, not not. He was he was pretty much trying to avoid a powerlifting stance where your lower back and glutes do most of the work. No, he focused on Olympic style squatting to put most of the pressure on his legs, right? So. The number one thing he did was he focused on the best exercise for each muscle. In this case, obviously, for legs, so squats, right? His other exercise was obviously hack squats. I'm going to get to that later. But the number one thing he did was he focused on efficiency. You know, you want to get a body part big, find the best exercise for that muscle. Before we even before you even begin thinking of sets and reps, just go straight to the bread and butter exercise. And he was in love with squats. You know, he was doing heavy squats at a time when bodybuilders were mainly playing around with the leg press and, you know, things like that. So that's one, right? He kept it simple. He focused on the best exercise. The second thing you have to remember about his, uh, you know, his squats, because I, I know a lot, of people are, a lot of people are probably thinking, well, everybody else squats. So what was the difference? Well, here's the difference. Heavy squats with high ass reps. Right. So number two, he was lifting very heavy, very heavy weights. I mean, he was known as doing, um, you know, upwards to six, seven hundred pounds. I mean, heavy ass weight. You know, that's so that's the second thing. And that's 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 kind of, you know, self-explanatory. You know, you want to build a great physique. We all know the importance that strength plays in um, recruiting muscle fibers and things like that. You will rarely meet a person that has a huge developed body part, natural or enhanced. And it's not strong at that body part. That's very rare. So there is obviously a correlation there, even though it's not always a causation. But he was very strong in squats. But the third thing, which is the most significant factor when it came to Tom Platts and putting him apart from the competition, was high reps. High ass reps. Tom Platts was a pioneer in high reps with heavy weights. Not high reps and light weights, just going for the pump. No. Heavy weights. Meaning he would take a weight that he could probably only do 10 reps with, and he would go to 20, 30, sometimes even 50 reps. He was a high rapper. That is when, if you uh, interview him and you read his, on his philosophies, he explains time and time again that he did not start seeing this massive increase in his quad size until he started doing this. You know, Meaning he was always squatting heavy when he started lifting, but he didn't have those freakish looking thighs. You know, He had the legs that everybody else had. It's when he started taking that same heavy weight but tripling the reps, I mean, he said that it, it would get to a point where he wanted to pass out. He would squat for so many reps on such a heavy weight that he would 
feel like passing out. He will throw up. He will have blood on his back from the weights. He will have, uh, I mean, just, you know, he, he, he called it needles. He said he felt like he had needles in his legs. The burning lactic acid was ridiculous, you know. And that is the, the you know, the number one weapon in his arsenal was he did a lot of high reps with heavyweight. This picture here shows you, uh, for those of you guys in the time flashing what I'm talking about, for those of you guys who don't, the guy on the left is actually Dr. Squat. You should know him by now. I mean, Dr. Squat is very famous. He had the, uh, he was one of the first guys to squat a thousand pounds on record. You know, very beast, you know, strong guy. But he, they did a competition. For those of you guys who are not familiar with the story, they did a competition. It was Tom Plass and Dr. Squat to see who was going to do have the, the heaviest squat, one rep max, and who was going to do the most reps. Now, obviously, when it came to the heaviest squat, Dr. Fred, you know, I mean, Dr. Squat destroyed him, right? Destroyed Tom Platts, I believe, by like 100 pounds. You know, I, I believe he squatted like 800 pounds or something, and and Tom Platts only squatted about 700 pounds. But when it came, so obviously, uh, Dr. Squat was a lot stronger than uh, Tom Platts. And I made videos explaining the difference between strength and hypertrophy and things like that, how they correlate and how they, they, they differ. But the, the the second thing, which is what this video mainly revolves about, you know, Ron, is when they started competing, you know, in terms of like high reps and who was going to do the most repetitions, Tom Plass destroyed him. I think that they lowered the weight down to, I believe, 500 pounds or some shit. And Dr. Squad did about 11 reps, which is respectable. And Tom Plass did 23 fucking reps. He doubled the amount of reps. And I might not sound like a lot on paper. Or an audio, but that is a lot of fucking reps with 500 pounds. Mind you, they were both the same weight, you know, 198 pounds, 200 pounds, roughly. And top left just destroyed it when it came to reps, you know. And a lot of studies came out and explained this phenomenon, right? Hypertrophy really revolves around volume. Volume, volume, volume. Weight is important, don't get me wrong. Intensity is important, but volume. Sets times reps, right? The more reps you do with the same weight, the more your legs are going to grow as opposed to just slapping weight on the ball. Yeah, you're going to get stronger, but eventually you're going to plateau. Eventually you're going to get to a point where your strength is increasing, but your muscle size is not really moving. Simply because your body found different ways to move the weight, you know, and, uh, mainly through neural adaptations. So this is, this, this is another perfect example of the whole, you know, um, volume debate right volume is key you know it's not enough just to get stronger you have to get stronger at higher rep ranges so moving on hack squats that was his second exercise that's the exercise that he did after squats he says he attributes his leg growth to only two exercises squats and hack squats he, he didn't do leg press and he only did leg extensions about a month before each show so it was mainly through squats and hack squats so, remember, at number one, we have the heavy-ass weights that he used. Number two, we have the uh, the high reps. And number three, we have the fact that he focused on the basic exercises, right? And number four, he did a lot of force reps, right? A lot of negatives and partial reps. I mean, he would take his workouts to beyond failure. Failure is an understatement. Now, again, remember, guys, he was on the juice. You know, he, had, you know, he was able to recover a lot faster than a natural guy would. But the theory is still the same. It still applies to natty lifters in terms of recruiting those muscle fibers, you know, like taking them beyond failure. Um, you know, again, you don't have to go to failure on every single set, but it helps to have those sets, at least one or two sets, where you really push your body beyond, you know, um, what it's capable of doing. And he was known for this. He would, you know, he would go to failure, then he would have his partner, you know, push the weight down. He would do isometrics. I mean, he would do all these uh, crazy additional reps after reaching failure on these heavy ass weights, you know. And he would also squat. When he would do the hack squat, he would also position his feet in a duck position so that he could do sissy squats and target different angles of his quads and, you know, things like that. So he pretty much used the same exercises but found ways to get the most out of them, you know. So he was really big, again, on negatives, partial reps, force reps, rest balls, all of these things, you know. And last but not least... He um he was very 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 big on recovery, right? He he knew the importance of recovery, even though he was enhanced. He knew the importance of recovery, so he would have a heavy day and a light day. You know, the heavy day he would do the balls to the wall. I mean, six hundred pounds for fifteen reps was his uh his his max, I believe, in terms of crazy repetitions. 
And on some days he would do uh, light. Uh, well, when he, when he says light, he means light relative to his heavy days, but it was still heavy fucking weight. Right? But on these days he would do like higher reps, 50 reps, 60 reps. He would squat for 10 minutes and things like that. So pretty much he alternated between lifting heavy and lifting relatively lighter weights. You know, Again, they were both heavy, but it's just relative to the heavy workouts, the light days were in quotes light. You know, and he did it because he understood recovery. He understood that he couldn't do those crazy ass workouts every single week, you know. So um, he really understood the balance between that. So again, guys, those are the things, the top five things that Tom Blast did to stand out from the competition. You know, again, remember, number one, he focused on the basic exercises, right? The squats and the hack squats, bread and butter movements. Number two. Heavy ass weight. He did not shy away from that challenge. Number three, he incorporated those high ass reps with the heavy weight. So he didn't just do three sets of five or three sets of ten. No, he would put on as much weight as possible and go beyond failure, right? Number four, he used those intensity techniques to pretty much recruit as many fibers as possible. You know, kind of like back to the Heinemann size principle where you want to fatigue every single row of motor units. And last but not least, he knew how to balance, re, you know, recovery by alternating between heavy days and light days, you know. And again, a lot of people have borrowed from from Milton Tom Platt's ideology on building muscle. I mean, C.T. Fletcher is one of them. Dorian Yates took some of these ideas, and you guys know what he did with them, you know, having one of the best backs in bodybuilding history. And to this day, you know, the bro science and the science word still confirm the training methodologies of Tom Blast. All right, guys, saw this video is longer than expected, but I really wanted to share this with you guys. I mean, I've, I researched Tom Blast years ago, years ago when I was doing my hypertrophy research and I, I'm, I'm blown away by how relevant his findings still are today. You know, science is finding these things out, you know, as the years go by. So incorporate those tips into your training. Remember to train based on your ability to recover. So if you're not on steroids, I don't want you doing, you know, more than your body can handle, right? And, you know, again, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't train hard. It's just be reasonable. Even on steroids, he understood the importance of recovery. How much more for natty guys, right? So that's it, guys. Hope this helps. Let me know who you want me to feature next. I mean, I've, you know, I've, I love bodybuilding. I've studied almost every top bodybuilder you could think about years ago, and I still have the files on my computer to this day. So just let me know, comment below who you want me to cover. Let me know if this video helped. If you learned something from it, give it a thumbs up. And stay tuned for the next one. I'm out of here, guys. Team 3D Alpha.